My opportunity today is to talk to you about the uh, various enhancements uh, to Recordine Professional and ProcessNet uh, with uh, Recordine V9R3. Okay, so first one, uh, there's been a variety of enhancements to the graphical user interface and actually we rely upon your feedback to give us uh, ideas and um, you know, since we have users around the world, uh, we're getting good feedback from many places. And so then we, we try to apply it. So uh, the first one is input shortcut for the modeling option. And so, as you know, when you give a command in the graphical user interface, then there might be, there's this pull down menu that gives various methods uh, for creating the object. So in other words, uh, one example is if you're creating a joint, uh, you can create a joint by clicking at a single location and, and then Recordine will try to infer every, all the other inputs. Or you can put in, uh, you know, pick different bodies and different locations and so forth. There's many, many options. So now if you hit uh, tab plus spacebar, then uh, that gets you over uh, to that command toolbar. So the, t the tab is uh, going to bring you to this uh, different input options and then with the space bar you go into the input field where you can then input a precise value. So if you're gonna, for example, create some kind of, uh, uh, let's say a piece of geometry, a sphere and it wants a radius, then you just uh, hit the, uh, the tab in the space bar and then you can get to input, input field and then just type in that radius or, or copy and paste it from a spreadsheet or wherever you have the data. Okay, so that's uh, all related to that command toolbar. Uh, so the next one is, uh, I think, been requested by many people uh, for a, a bit of time. And that is, uh, you know, on a lot of the CAD systems, uh, when you zoomed, uh, you could, you know, pick a reference point and then it would kind of zoom in to, towards that point. And so now if you hit the control key, and then you can use the wheel on your mouse. Um, then with that, then you're able to uh, select the reference point. Um, so I think this is a pretty welcome uh, upgrade uh, to add this enhancement. Um, this next one I think is another great one. Um, so there's this new icon in the view control bar and in the working plane toolbar. And uh, you can either view at a plane or change to a plane. And the idea here is this is an arbitrary plane and that arbitrary plane is selected by using any of the planes that are available for each marker in the model. So if you have something that's oriented in some very strange angle, um, you can just use any marker on that body or on that joint or whatever, and then you can do this view at plane. When you click that, then you can just come and, and move around by the marker and it will highlight the different planes. Once you have what you want, you just click it. And then the viewing plane is then changed. So then uh, also with the rotational uh, control in, in the viewing screen, uh, this again has been a long time requested thing to I mean, we've had this ability to define a center point, but it was a separate operation. So now you can pick a center point for your rotation, uh, you know, as you are, uh, you know, doing the rotation operation. So the idea is the shortcut key is, is the Y, letter Y. And then, so you click that or press on that key. And then the cursor is ready for you to navigate to the center point of interest for the rotation. So you navigate to the point and then when it's highlighted, then you click on the left mouse button and then uh, you then hold down the left mouse button. I mean, so in other words, you click down, you pick the point and then you hold that left key down. And then as you move the mouse, then it's rotating about the point you've selected. So this makes it easy to go and rotate around a given point uh, quickly uh, without the separate command needed. So I think, uh, you know, this 
these enhancements of these uh, last two slides here are uh, going to be really helpful for uh, working more efficiently in the, the working window, uh, graphics window in RecordDyne. One of the things that sometimes has been, you know, almost irritating is that as you're changing modes in RecordDyne um, and, and you would come back to where you were, then things would be reset in a way that uh, wasn't uh, what was wanted. So uh, uh, the database window now has some added intelligence that uh, when you go from like a main level uh, down into a subsystem or into the body edit mode for that matter, and then you come back up, then you're in the very same location that you left in the database window. So this isn't uh, maybe a, a huge thing, but I think it's a very helpful and convenient thing. Uh, and uh, you know, by having things be the same way as when you left them, you know, for me, it's like having the database window reset, um, you know, as a distraction and kind of, you know, would break my concentration sometimes. So really happy to see this enhancement. As you know, a, f a few releases back, uh, RecordDyne uh, introduced this uh, relation map. And uh, so the idea is that you could pick a component in the model and then this map would come up and it would show everything that was, you know, connected to the entity that you had selected. So in this case, like on the left uh, with the V9R2 view, we can see that we pick a body and then we can see, oh, there's a couple joints. Um, between that body and another, another body, and then there's also one contact between that body and another body. So um, then this would be displayed, and then you could work with that. So now with the V9R3, you still have that capability, um, but now the icons, instead of just having circles for everything, now we have the very same icons that are appearing um, in the uh, database window are now also used uh, for the relation map. You know, and I think that's really helpful because, you know, we don't like to have to learn many things and also we don't like things depicted in different ways when they're actually the same thing. So now uh, with this enhancement in V9R3, then these icons will look very familiar to us and uh, then we'll be able to uh, interact with things in a better way. The other thing that you can do is um, when you, you, any of these entities that occur in the relation map, you can select that entity, right mouse click, and pop up a, the property dialog box for that entity without having to go back to the database window. So that's uh, anytime we can uh, get rid of extra steps, that's a good thing. Next one, I don't know how many people are doing the DOE and RecordDyne, um, but, you know, in, in RecordDyne Professional, in the base package, we have a basic DOE capability. Uh, there's a more advanced DOE capability um, as part of the auto design module that has some very uh, sophisticated DOE planning uh, tools and so forth. But in either case, uh, when you're doing a DOE simulation, you know, you plan a set of runs and uh, the problem has been is that sometimes when you're changing different parameter values, uh, sometimes you end up uh, in a situation, you end up posing a situation which actually is not valid. And then the simulation uh, ends prematurely because it's not possible to continue the solution. You know, maybe a certain component is too long or something. Um, so what's happened in the past is that the DOE process would stop uh, part of the way through, and um, and then you, you wouldn't get the other results, and that was not very good because uh, sometimes people were leveraging the ability to set up the DOE and then you know have a, a number of runs occurring overnight, and so then you come in the next morning and see, okay, oh yeah, I was out of bounds or out of range um, with a certain thing, but then you know the other uh, trials that maybe were valid were not run because it just would quit the whole process. So you can see now in the design study dialog box here on the left, on the bottom, there's a new section here which you can check on, which is when simulation fails, continue with the next DOE trial. And uh, if there is a failure, set the PI, which is the performance index, it's the output, 
So, you know, and, and you can have any number of uh, performance indices. So all of them will be set to a value of minus one or, or whatever you put into this uh, field here. So uh, in the case of, uh, you know, having information for optimization or whatever, um, a lot of times the technique used is that if the solution is invalid, then to help the optimizer know that, hey, that's a bad place to go, then if you're trying to minimize something, then you may set the value to, you know, kind of a high value compared to the other values. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend setting it like uh, super high because then numerically uh, you could, uh, you know, have some issues. But uh, just to have it be, you know, three or four times higher, say, than the other values, uh, something like that. Or if you're trying to maximize something, then you could set it to be three or uh, four times uh, lower than uh, the other values you're working with. But something to give feedback uh, so that whether you're doing the uh, response surface or the optimization, uh, you know, you're given some kind of feedback that that's an invalid location. Anyway, so you get to set what that is. And then when you run the simulation, it'll keep going. In this case, um, the model that was uh, being worked with, it had a certain number of valid solutions. And then once you got to these uh, last four, four cases, they were all invalid. Uh, but the point is each one of them was run and then you were able to find out that they were all invalid. Um, you know, it is possible that you have an invalid solution and maybe the next one is valid. So in that case, then you would have some reasonable number here and so forth. So I think this makes the DOE uh, capability more useful, you know, a lot better knowing that if you're going to do overnight run or over the weekend set of runs, uh, that it will keep, go, keep going and do all the runs. If you run out of disk space or something like that, there's nothing we're going to do about that, but uh, at least the process uh, from the record line side will keep going. Uh, this is uh, quite new. Um, as you know, we're using the Parasolid uh, graphics kernel in Record9, and we have been for a very long time. And uh, when we first started, uh, we really couldn't access a lot of the capabilities of Parasolid. And as time goes on, uh, we're giving more, and more access to it. So, uh, you know, we, we still are assuming a process where people are importing geometry, uh, whether it's, you know, from a, a Parasolid file or, uh, you know, we have the translators that can import uh, directly the CAD files. Um, and then uh, uh, we also have a step translator. So we're assuming people are mostly importing geometry, but uh, sometimes you want to do modifications. And so the ability to import geometry from CAD and then in record be able to modify it can be very helpful. So you don't have to go back to CAD and have to do the modification there and then do the export from CAD, import to record and so forth. Um, you know, the, our capability is quite robust that you can go ahead and add fillets and different things. Um, you know, and I've had cases where there was contact that was going around the corner of some geometry, but the way it was modeled uh, the corner was like uh, perfectly sharp. And so when you have that kind of a 90 degree uh, turn on a surface, that's supposed to be a contact surface. It, uh, you know, numerically is not well-defined uh, where you go past that uh, corner. So then to put in a fillet so that you have this gradual um, change of angle, it's uh, a lot more reasonable and the contact calculation works a lot better. So that's been available for some time. Um, but then what used to be the case is that, well, in, in the case where you're creating your own geometry, you would have a collection of primitives, a collection of Boolean operations. And once you had that built up, if you wanted to make a change, you had to kind of delete and undo a lot of things, make the change and then kind of redo the Boolean operations. But now uh, we have this ability where you can actually go in and change the properties. Um, and then the other thing, so you can see on this pop-up menu, there's a properties uh, capability on this tree, which has now been added. So in other words, you have this subtract six is your um, piece of geometry that you've created. And now there's this new tab called Boolean. And that's where you have this tree structure shown. And then you can go into each area, look at the properties, but then you also have this swap capability. 
So if you pick swap, then you can actually bring in some of the basic child geometry. You can swap it uh, with some other piece of geometry. So, um, so between these two capabilities, being able to modify things without having to redo everything and to be able to swap in geometry without having to redo everything, this really makes it a lot more approachable to uh, quickly you know, examine different design changes. And then uh, in conjunction with all that, um, you can have parametric values uh, as part of the basic pieces of geometry which then means that uh, you can have a parametric value actually morphing the geometry, uh, which, you know, we didn't have this capability to do it this way before. So this can be, I think, very powerful. So then thinking back to the DOE, um, you know, you can set up a, a range of runs where you're actually morphing the geometry as well as, you know, other characteristics of the model like spring stiffnesses or whatnot. More enhancements on the solid modeling. Uh, so we have this ability to split uh, a component, a solid, into two pieces nice. uh, by using a surface. So you just define the surface and then reference that surface and then you get the two different components. And then another capability that's new is this new region component. So basically, you may have, uh, and, you know, and actually with, uh, you know, the particle works and the EDEM models, I mean, sometimes we, we're, we're generating this place for the particles to go. So in this case, you can actually have a solid model um, and then you just uh, put that within a big block. You do the region operation um, and then it will create the uh, it'll create a cavity in the block where it subtracts out everything, you know, for that particular body. And then you know you can uh, you know do some other operations on this block, but you can you know like you know, you know maybe you want to do this region operation and then do this new split operation, and then as you see, it's like you have half of a mold. Um, so then if you want to then at that point uh, say okay I want to use particle works to uh, model injecting my fluid into my mold. You could do something like that pretty quickly to set it up. Okay. Oh, you know, over time we've been adding more and more with regards to, uh, you know, looking at contacts more accurately and in particular looking at contact pressures. Um, so as we can see in the animation here, we have a gear set and the gear profile is not perfectly flat. So, you know, we can see how we have this distributed contact pressure. And uh, so this contact pressure is available with the various geo contacts, geo surface, geo sphere, geo cylinder. And uh, also with the gear toolkit, with the gear involute. And then there's also a contact a UV surface to sphere. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a couple slides. Uh, UV just means it's a surface where you're specifying a U and a B parameter, which describes the uh, density of the contact uh, representation um, according to the, the values you get for U and V. So in order to set this up, if you look at the properties dialog for the geosurface contact, uh, we have some new options here to be able to calculate pressure. And that's done, you know, you can pick, you know, one or both contact uh, surfaces. And, uh, you know, it, it all depends on, you know, what's the right thing to do? Well, it depends on the contact uh, situation and what those surfaces are shaped like. Uh, sometimes to have both contact uh, pressures being shown, it gets to be a little bit too confusing. So you may pick, want to pick one or the other. It just depends upon the shape of things. Anyway, and then, uh, uh, then under the contour dialog box, um, then again, you can pick uh, which item, uh, which contact to include, um, you know, in the particular uh, viewing of it. And then you'll get something like the animation shown here on the lower right. So this, uh, I think, uh, and this information can be very helpful to understand what's happening in the system like the gear object, um, there are ways to modify the tooth profile. So then you can do modifications and compare the pressure distribution. 
Okay, so uh, it seems like each release we're always getting more with the geo contact. And uh, so one of the contacts that we've had is this geo curve to surface contact. And now there's a new field of information that you can set, which controls the thickness of the curve. So th this is uh, set with the curve segments, um, which is accessed in the properties dialog box um, for that uh, geo curve surface contact. Um, so this, the thickness is used so that even though the curve is a, like a, a one dimensional topology, so it's just, you know, segment to segment to segment, like a string, by putting in that thickness, then you actually have a finite thickness with regards to the contacts. So then now you have something that is very much like a cable. Um, so that uh, that can be very helpful. And you know, th this kind of capability has existed before um, when using the full flex curve, uh, but now we have this capability when you have, you know, the little rigid segments on the curve. Uh, so now they can have a thickness. Okay, and then uh, for the geosphere contact, we've added in uh, this uh, contact sphere option. Um, and you've seen this before with some of the other contacts, uh, but you can check on to synchronize with the geometry. And then if you have, you know, if you're using a sphere uh, to do this contact, if you modify the size of the sphere, then uh, that modification uh, then applies uh, to this contact automatically. So again, if you're doing a design of experiments, doing many runs, uh, you can just use a parameter to change the size of the sphere, and then the contact is already updated for you. So that's uh, quite convenient. Okay, here's that UV surface to sphere contact. So as you can see here, um, in this middle left uh, picture here, we have the, the axis showing the V direction, U direction for the sheet that the sphere is gonna sit on. So uh, in the lower left, uh, we see what the result is. If in the U direction, we have a total of 20 segments, and then in the V direction, we have a total of five segments, then we get something that looks like that. Um, and then as we add, uh, increase the U and V values, then uh, we get the finer uh, discretization of the contact surface, as you see there. So uh, then uh, when you're, so the, the, the contact itself looks just, you know, very consistent with the other contacts. And then when you click on this contact geometry button, then you have the opportunity to change the number of patches in the U and V direction. And, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, with these other contacts, uh, basically it's, it's uh, changing the resolution of the contact patches uh, according to factors that you can control, other factors like uh, that are related to curvature and so forth. Um, so things like the plane tolerance factor is an example of that. In this case, um, even though there's a curve um, to this uh, surface, uh, what we want to do here is as the ball roll, rolls down it, uh, we really want to have uniform uh, discretization of the contact patches uh, as we go through the extent of the surface. And so this UV control makes it very convenient to uh, set it up like that. So that's our UV surface to sphere contact. So another new contact. Seems like we get a new contact with every release and uh, which just gives us more and more capability. Okay, next one here is a Campbell diagram. And uh, this one, you know, Campbell diagrams are used a lot um, in certain areas, but they also, you know, have usages, uh, you know, beyond the normal thing. But, you know, kind of the first place I ever saw a Campbell diagram used is uh, with respect to looking at uh, behavior of an engine. And so you'd sweep through a certain RPM and then you would see certain frequencies. And so you wanted to plot that. So the Campbell diagram has existed for several Recordine releases. So uh, it was there with V9R1, it was enhanced in V9R2, and now with V9R3, more enhancements to actually add a 3D version of it, uh, which can be very helpful in visualizing uh, what is going on. 
Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, the dialog box and then the ability to uh, switch between the 2D and the 3D graph type, as I'm pointing to here under this uh, uh, camel diagram dialog box down here. So looking at the RPM versus frequency, RPM versus order, um, you can have all these different things and the magnitude of the function all shown in the 3D Campbell diagram. So you get to choose, um, as you see in the dialog box, I mean, you know, here, you know, the typical things of RPM and frequency and whatnot, but you're choosing uh, what function goes in there. And uh, so then that opens it up for other applications outside of the engine realm. Um, and we do, we do have, uh, I've seen the usage of this, uh, new 3D capability, um, you know, for other things. So, I mean, it is versatile, not just for engines. Uh, this is a new capability, I think quite useful. Um, sometimes it's uh, appropriate to run the simulation in pieces. And, uh, you know, with the uh, initial conditions file, uh, you can run a simulation to a certain point and then you can uh, restart later on from where you were and just keep going. Well, then you've had two sets of outputs and, you know, separate animations and whatever. But now there's new capability that's uh, built into the user interface to merge uh, results files all together. And uh, you can see we have the different results files. So the RPLT, um, yeah, it can be all merged together for the plotting. And then the RIN is record, record ion animation data. And uh, you can even uh, merge particle data um, from these co simulations all together to get then one single run. And, uh, you know, as far as uh, both animation and plotting. 